this issue of climate change in a good way, in a very good way, and especially in, in getting out into the community and talking to people, helping to educate people, which is what this is about, and also uh, helping to drive people toward action and giving them ideas about what they can do, how they can participate. And uh, so it's been a real pleasure working with Pam over the last few years, now and again. And after Pam, Art Spooner from our environment, environmental justice team will, will talk also about what we're doing. So please welcome Pam Tate. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's really nice to be here, and thanks, Jim, for uh, asking me to come. And uh, I, I'm just going to cover, uh, I'm trying to think of, how, yeah, I'll just kind of do it like this from the side. Um, what I'm going to cover today uh, is just a brief uh, section on the impact the climate emergency is having. And a lot of you know some of this data, but I, I won't spend a lot of time on it because what I really want to spend the bulk of our time on is the second section, under, understanding what you can do about it as an individual and also what you can, what you can do in this community to do something about this. So that's what we'll cover, and I'm trying to fit it into the time I've got. Jim is gonna let me know if I'm running over. I like to start these presentations with this picture because it was taken from the space station, and it's, it's the horizon of Earth. And that blue ribbon that you see is our atmosphere. And you know we don't have a limitless sky above us like it looks like we do when you look up. It's very thin ribbon of atmosphere. And the sad thing is that we are dumping 110 million tons of pollution into that little thin layer every day. This, has been hap this is happening every day. So I want you to think about that and how do we reduce those emissions from going up there into the atmosphere. That's really uh, what the bulk of this is going to be about. What can we do? Um, now, the, the greenhouse gases that are causing us all these problems, they come from all these different sectors. I, I won't go into detail about the sectors. But the interesting thing to me is that even though nationally, transportation is the major area that causes emissions in our country, uh, look at Oak Park. Uh, this was a greenhouse gas inventory done just a, a few years ago in preparation for the Climate Ready Oak Park uh, Climate Action Plan. And this, um, th this inventory shows us an interesting thing, which is that between the 37% that is residential, coming from our houses and apartments, and the 33% coming from our commercial buildings, really, in our village, 70% of the emissions are coming from our buildings. Um, transportation is second. But if we want to tackle lowering emissions here in our village, our buildings are the heart of it. Um, so I want you to see the reality of global warming. A lot of people say, oh, you know, it's just seasonal. It's not real. This is a picture of what's been happening uh, on the planet as a whole. And if we looked out into 2023, that red bar would really go up because um, 2023 was the hottest year on record for the world. And 2024 promises to be even hotter than 2023. And, that, and we experience some of that here, but not like people do in certain parts of the world. We are still fortunate that we don't experience it quite as dramatically. But we will, and we already are. Uh, now, this is one of the things that I've noticed uh, really increasing, first through what we read and also um, what we saw last summer. I don't know, do you remember the orange sky of last summer? Well, these were fires that were happening in Canada. Th you know, it was like 1,000 miles away. But the entire upper Midwest and Northeast was just covered in the same um, red sky. And that has to do then with what we're breathing in. And so... What does that mean? It means that when the planet is hotter, there are more fires, and they're more intense, and they last longer. Now, fortunately, in a way fortunately, uh, the ocean absorbs 
over 90% of this, this extra heat that is coming uh, from our emissions. But the bad part about that is that then as the ocean warms up, it causes a lot of changes in our weather patterns. And so the, the one thing I wanna show you, this, this helped me understand why we have so much more flooding. Um, when warm water evaporates from the ocean, there's more of it, and so the precipitation increases. And then the precipitation comes in intense periods, uh, like we see sometimes. And then the water, the floods, return to the sea through mudslides and flooding and, and rivers washing into the sea with all the sediment. Um, so the warmer the ocean, the more severe the weather becomes. Um, but if the ocean had not been absorbing all, all these carbon emissions, we would be already in an unlivable situation. So what we've got to do is stop the emissions, obviously, right? Um, so um, this is the reality of where we are globally, that floods and extreme rainfall events, they're now occurring four times more often than they did just in 1980. And and if you have the feeling that it's occurring a lot, you're right, because it's four times as often. And we have all of these one in a thousand year uh, experiences of downpours. There have now been 12 of them, uh, I'm sorry, 22 of them in the last 12 years. So when we think that things are changing, believe me, they really are changing, and this really is an emergency. This is one picture I just had to show you. This is an example of a, what's called a rain bomb, where the precipitation is so severe that it ends up looking like a bomb. But what that is, that was taken in Montana, but it's actually a, a supercell storm with precipitation. And you can imagine the flooding that those people experienced. And I have to show you one picture of Chicago. Do you remember the summer of 21 when we had that incredible flooding in the city um, and here? Well, it was so bad that the manhole covers off of all the sewers blew open from all the water and sewage was spewing into the streets in the city. I was there and I experienced that and I later learned why. I didn't know at the time that it was because the sewers in our tunnel system couldn't handle the downpour. So this is just to show you the, the, all of the different extreme weather examples. We could spend the entire time here of, for me, show, of me showing you the devastation around the world, but then we'd all leave depressed. <laughs> and so instead we're gonna talk about what, we, what can be done. Um, but I do wanna say one more thing about impact before we get to solutions. And that is something that I think is very important and that is the spread of infectious diseases. A lot of people are worried about this, but they don't understand the link to climate change. Um, because the air is warmer and the, sea, and the growing season and incubation season is longer, uh, tropical diseases are on the move. That's why we see West Nile virus here now where we didn't some years back. It's because our earth up here, even, even up near the Great Lakes, is warmer. And, and what that, What's happening, therefore, is that infectious diseases have a better climate. They're doing better because our climate is warming. And so we're, what we're doing really is we're disrupting our natural ecosystems through climate change. And that then affects our health. So it's not just weather, because a lot of people in the Midwest say, oh, you know, I live here and I don't have to worry about sea level rise or fires. Well, we do have to worry about our health and flooding and drought and some of the other things. So it is an issue for us as well. Um, and last, even the World Economic Forum knows it's a problem. Seven out of the 10 biggest risks to the global economy are from climate change or they're related to climate change. And that means that the economy is suffering and will suffer. As, is, uh, as are insurance companies who then raise our rates to pay for all of the disasters they are covering. <laughs> so it does affect us. Um, so we do have solutions. And first I wanna talk about the individual ones. 
Uh, and I don't know if, if you know this, but this was a surprise to me. I read um, in Electrify America, a wonderful uh, website, by the way, Electrify America, and I have on the table over there a list of all the links to the resources I mention here, so you can pick up the information before you go. But Electrify America says that 40% of the decisions that are made at our kitchen table can, are going to lower, 40% of emissions could be lowered by the decisions that we make. In other words, what car we drive, what stove we use, what hot water heater we use, what furnace we use, um, uh, all the, the big things that could limit our emissions as individuals. And of course there are other things you can do, but I'm gonna focus on some of the big ones, the biggest ones. Um, why should you electrify your home or your apartment? Well, first of all, it's gonna be a lot less expensive. I mean, don't, don't forget that. It, it will help you in terms of cost. But uh, we have to get to zero emissions in our country. We have to get to zero emissions and we need to do it faster rather than slower. And the way to do that is we have to electrify all these machines that are being talked about in this quote from Rewiring America. We have to electrify uh, 50 million machines a year for the next quarter century to get to zero emissions. That means our machines, our dryers, our washers, our hot water heaters, our cars, we have to make those changes ourselves in order to get to this goal. Um, and there's no time this morning, if there were more time, I would go through this with you, but these are the big ones, the key home electrification projects. Um, solar energy, your car, uh, your furnace and AC together, and your hot pump, uh, your um, hot water heater. Those are the big ones that, that have the most emissions and can save the most if you make a change. I'm in the middle right now of electrifying an old home in Oak Park. And uh, I've, I'm taking it one step at a time, and I'm learning from my friends at the Oak Park Climate Action Network, which I'll talk about. And it's an expensive proposition, but it will pay off in the value of the house, in my monthly bills. So I'm in the middle of installing a heat pump, uh, one, the, one of the biggest emitters. But there are rebates and tax credits available now for every one of these decisions that you need to make. And I'm not suggesting that you go out tomorrow and just suddenly replace everything. What, you're, what you need to think about, though, is that when any of your appliances is reaching the end of its, use, of its useful life for you, that is the time to replace it with electric. Just don't go out and buy another gas-powered machine for your house. And don't wait until your water heater breaks and then in a rush go out and buy a gas water heater because it'll be there for 12 or 15 years and it'll just keep producing emissions. So replace it with electric. That's, that's a really important step to take. So we'll hear more from Art, I think, about uh, solar, rooftop and community solar. But if you have a good roof and you can go with rooftop solar, big important decision to limit emissions. If you can't or you live in a, a building where other people uh, wouldn't agree, to have solar panels, you can go to community solar, which is what I did, and you save about 20% on your electric bills, and you save on emissions as well. And Art will t talk more about that. Um, and then electrify your car. N no question. I mean, 81% of all the um, uh, emissions from vehicle miles travel come from our personal cars. We can change that. Um, and we, we live in a village that we hope will start to put in more chargers so that we, and, and they'll be helped by government funds so that we can have places to charge our cars other than a garage. Um, and furthermore, the maintenance costs are really low. That's why auto dealers aren't wild about EVs because they make all their money on service. <laughs> so if your car needs less service, they make less money. So they don't tend to help you when you go to an auto dealer. Uh, because they want to sell you a gas-powered car where there's more service. <laughs> but here's, here's the um, interesting thing about tax credits. You can still get a tax credit at the uh, federal level, and even here in, here in Illinois, 
there's a, a rebate for buying an electric car. If you get in early, they run, they run out of money every time so fast that it's hard for you to get the rebate. But Illinois has one as well. Um, so so there, there are incentives out there to get us to do this, little carrots uh, to try to move us along. But here's the stick side, and that is that 17 states and growing are making decisions to phase out all fossil fuel car purchases by 2035. Uh, Illinois, we have legislation before the General Assembly right now to do that, and there are a lot of people fighting it. I hope we can pass it. But if we won't, don't pass it this year, we'll pass it next year, being the bulldog that I am, <laughs> that you described. <laughs> We're going to work on passing it next year. Um, but the idea is that people realize we've got to phase these things out. And so car manufacturers are hearing this, and they are producing more electric cars. And I believe that soon we'll be where Europe is. I mean, we're way behind Europe in terms of a transition to electrification. So we have, we have a ways to go. Um, now, this is a great decision by the Biden administration. They just announced, I don't know if you saw this in the New York Times, but March 20th they announced uh, that new regulations are designed to ensure that uh, new cars and light trucks uh, will be um, electric or hybrid by 2032. That's a big deal, just to have, and boy, are they getting flack for that, uh, for making that decision, but it's really an important one. Now, the next thing is uh, heat pumps. They, they are uh, one of the biggest things that emit from our homes, and we don't have time this morning to describe all the rebates and everything that you can get for them, but what I do want to show you is an interesting thing that uh, I didn't really understand them, and so what I found is that you can use a heat pump both for heating and air conditioning. So you don't have to buy a, a, a central air conditioning system. The heat pump does both things. It, take, it circulates heat uh, from inside or outside. There's a circulatory way that it works. And you, you can read the details uh, there for, for a minute. But it, it works the same in, in, except in reverse in the summer and the winter. And, uh, and it, doesn't use, it just uses electricity. And uh, there are cold water heat pumps now, uh, cold weather heat pumps, excuse me, that, uh, that will help you uh, keep the uh, temperature constant in your house down to 10 below zero. And if you even want it down further, there are some things you can add on to make it uh, heated at 25 below zero. Uh, and so it, it is a very efficient system and will end up lowering your bills. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm going to skip the, the rebates one because of time. Um, but then there's the heat pump water heater. It's the same principle as a heat pump, and, but it works that way to cool and heat your water. It's a circulatory system that, that works for both heating and cooling. And again, much more efficient. Uh, will save you a lot of money in the long term. Uh, now, uh, I'm not going to, again, go through the details of how it works because you can look into it on our website, the uh, Oak Park Climate Action Network website. We have resources and all these things there. Um, now, these are other things you can do. You can move to an electric dryer, you can, a, a heat pump electric dryer. You can move to an induction electric uh, stovetop. You can move to an electric oven. I just got my induction stovetop, and uh, some of you that know me know I'm not a cook, but when I do use it, it, it heats everything so much more quickly. It's so much more efficient, I, and I don't have the, the gas coming up, which is not good for your health, by the way, uh, in your house. Uh, there's a lot of literature out on that now. So I don't have any of that. I just, it just heats up instantly, and, um, and I'm really glad that I, that I, that I uh, did the purchase. And I got a rebate for it from ComEd, and I'll get another one from the federal government. Um, then, besides the big four that I just mentioned, cars, gas heaters, water heaters, you know, uh, and stoves, there's things other, many things others of you are working on that you can do. Um, you can 
plant and nurture lots of trees and native plants. Um, that will obviously help with flooding, cooling, and all kinds of other things. I mean, that, that's something you definitely want to do as much as you can. We'd love to see more native plants in Oak Park. They absorb water. They'll help keep flooding from your basement, that's for sure. Um, and uh, get out of your car. <laughs> we were just talking about electric bikes this morning. You know, for those of us that are older and may not want to be uh, pedaling so much on our bikes, what about an electric bike? Uh, that's a great way to get around. Um, and there are many other uh, ways, like public transit, like walking, that, that, <laughs> that could make a big difference. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty radical, but you know, walking would be a good thing. Um, and let's think about our composting program in Oak Park. Right now, it's an opt-in program. I think that Village should turn it into an opt-out program so that you are automatically in it when you start living here unless you opt out of it. I think we need more. Why is composting important? Because when you send organic material to the landfill, do you know what it turns into? Methane. And methane is one of the biggest um, polluters and causers of emission out there. 80 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. It doesn't stay in the atmosphere as long, but it stays in the atmosphere for a couple decades. So why do we want to send organics to landfills and produce methane? when we could be composting the organics. You know, the village has gray bins. You just put them out in, outside your house and dump your, your leaves and food scraps and whatever in there. They pick it up once a week. It's, it's, it's a good program. We should use it, and we should stop using plastic. I, you all know about plastic. I don't need to talk about that. So you may say to yourself when you hear how bad the climate crisis is, but it's just me. What can I do? You know, um, what? Can I make a difference? And of course you can. Um, and I just want to note that the ripple effect is what we're after here. What we do individually influences our neighbors and our community, so one person's action does make a difference. And I like to quote two of my favorite people. Um, I won't, I won't uh, read Mother Teresa's, but I will read Margaret Mead's. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Well, that leads me to uh, the Community Actions and the Oak Park Climate Action Network, uh, which Susan was instrumental in forming about three and a half years ago, I would say. Uh, and I joined in from the beginning. Um, and we're a volunteer group. And what we do is advocate for change, um, like we advocated to create the Climate Action Plan for the village. And we now have one that was passed. Um, and there are, those are the goals of Climate Ready Oak Park. And note, decrease community-wide greenhouse gas emissions by 60% by 2030. That is six years from now. We have a lot of work to do. So that was one of the goals of Climate Ready Oak Park. Um, and you've all, you all know this, but passing the plan isn't the end, it's step one. Then you have to implement the plan and that means you have to put money behind the plan. So we've been advocating for ordinances and money. We're doing better with ordinances and not so well with money. <laughs> um, what, what we did pass though is this ordinance that as of uh, June of 23, I mean, I'm sorry, January 24, any new construction in the village cannot have a gas hookup. All new construction must be electric. And thank you to the board for passing that ordinance. And now, um, now we have to work on existing homes because the new homes will, will be all electric. Uh, and we're the first village to do this in the Midwest. So we're pretty proud of that and we worked hard on that. Um, and there are other advocacy efforts that I don't have time for this morning but I do want to note that the one on banning gas-powered leaf blowers is going to go into effect. And that may seem like a small thing, but boy, you can't believe how much they emit. 
and how bad they are for the guys that have to use them in the landscaping companies. So it's, it's as of 2025, right? Yeah, as of 2025, no more gas-powered leaf blowers in our village. Now, that's not a small thing. That's one important change that we have made by being a committed group of citizens working on these issues. Um, and our newest development is what we launched a couple weeks ago, which is community climate coaches. Um, we asked the village to set up a one-stop center for coaching residents, and they haven't done it. So what we decided is, well, let's start a volunteer network of coaches, and we'll help neighbor to neighbor, we'll help people go through this process. So we launched that on the 19th of March. We've already had, up until yesterday, we had eight people, and yesterday at the Eco Extravaganza, we probably got 10 more. So we have our first 18 people that have asked for coaching. And let me just say to you, um, these are the areas. They're all the areas I've been talking about, that we have coaches that will help you for free to get going, how to get started, how to insulate your home, how to, how to well, all about heat pumps, all about electric vehicles, uh, native gardening, all the things you might want to know about. There is a coach that has already been there and done that. And we, all the coaches have volunteered their time. And it's a simple thing. You just go into the website that I have there. And the link is on the table. And you say, I need a coach for, I'm thinking about a heat pump. I, need, I would like to talk to a coach. And you get 30 minutes of time with someone to um, get you started and to refer you to professionals who can do the work. And we get no payback from any of this. We're not linked up to any of the contractors. There's no money exchanged or anything. But we keep you your information confidential. And then we refer you to professionals who can help you. And you just can't imagine how many people yesterday said to me, this is just what I need. We were at the Oak Park Public Library for the eco extravaganza, and people really were interested. It was exciting. It was great. To, to see that they were ready to do this. And then we work with other bodies um, on, on uh, climate practices as well. So you then need to help us spread the word. Use your voice. You all belong to other community organizations. Invite us to come and talk. Um, tell other people about what we're doing. Invite people to, to get a, a climate coach. We, it's simple. You know, you just go to the website, you sign up, you get somebody to help you. It's, it's, it's a pretty good service, and, and the people that, have, that are doing it have been there and done that, so they can help you. So use your voice, um, and um, join OPCAN, join the Oak Park Climate Action Network. We meet once a month, Wednesday nights at 7, um, and there's information on the website. Join us. We, we need more people to be bulldogs. We need, we need that. Um, and then, of course, I can't leave today without mentioning that this is 2024, and we have a chance to vote. And so let's vote on people that want to make change, that are not climate deniers. We have no time for them. So at all levels, vote for climate advocates. And then I'll end with this. This is one of my favorite people, Robert F. Kennedy, not the current Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, <laughs> few, few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. And in the total of all those acts will be written the history of this generation. And that's what I believe, and that's what, that's what moves me, because that's the earth I care about. Thank you. We're doing a setup here that uh, if you have time, please step by the table afterwards uh, off to the side. It has some good materials there. Number one is a resource sheet that has uh, links and websites for all the different organizations that are around the, the community here, including uh, Oak Park Climate Action Network 
and, um, and many others. West Cook Wild Ones that deals with uh, native plants. And we also have some information about uh, the Interfaith Green Network, which our green team here is a member of, about 15 to 20 congregations in the Oak Park and River Forest area that work together and share information about what we're doing and, and the latest trends and so on. So there's information about that. Uh, and there's a sign-up sheet if you'd like to think about participating with the environmental justice team here at uh, First United. There's a sign-up list there if you want more information about it or talk to us afterwards. Uh, so please check out the table. Uh, there's a lot of good, good information there. We are really proud of our electrification ordinance at the village because we were the first in the Midwest, but we're getting a lot of attention for it. It is very likely not going to take effect because NICOR is, uh, people's, is it people's? It's NICOR. NICOR is coming after us, mm -hmm. so, coming after the village um, uh, in a big way. And um, I keep asking the people at the village when it's, when it's public, and they keep saying not yet, not yet. So that's all I'm going to say, but you can imagine we are going to... Uh, spring into action when they finally make their threat public um, and real. But um, clearly, when you make big moves like this, there's going to be backlash. Um, the city of Berkeley passed an electrification ordinance that went to the, you know, I don't know how courts work because I'm not an attorney, but it went to like a circuit court and was struck down. So Berkeley's electrification ordinance is out. Um, the state of Illinois has backed down on theirs. The city of Chicago is waiting until um, to see what happens with us. And anyway, there's, there's repercussions. And so we're really happy um, that we passed it, but um, looking f to see what's going to happen next. There's a fight. There's a fight. Pam, thank you so much. Pam. And I worked independently on these presentations, and then when we got together, it turns out you talked about at this level, and I'm going to talk about at this level a little more granular, but we're, we have exactly the same theme. I want to start by asking just for a sh quick show of hands on some things, on all the things that Pam was talking about, but I just want to know how many of you are already doing this kind of thing. How many of you have rooft rooftop solar on your homes? Several. Great. How many of you are subscribed to community solar? An equal number. We don't, wow. <laughs> the solar message is getting out. How many of you have a heat pump in your home? Getting one. There you go. Okay. How many of you have an electric water heater? There you go. Uh, induction stove? There you go. Okay. Home composting. How many of you do the old traditional farmer type of home composting? And how many do are enrolled in municipal composting? The, wow, almost everyone is doing some kind of composting. How many of you are using reusable shopping bags? When you, wow, that's 100%. Great. And how many of you are doing styrofoam recycling? How many of you have figured out that there's a, a way to collect your styrofoam? Great. Thank you all for, for doing that. It's important to do that. So one of the themes of this presentation that I want to talk about, I want to talk about three themes, but I don't want to spend a lot of time, but I just want you to think about each of these. First of all, we're all on a journey, and those of you who raised your hands know that you kind of took the first step of doing something, and you know that there are many more steps, and the more people that start these journeys, the better. Most of you have already started that already, but I want to encourage you to continue and tell your friends and neighbors and your families how important it is to keep this concept of journey so that everyone knows that it's a, a sequence. It's not a one-time event. Continuing education. I didn't even know what a heat pump was four years ago, and I'm going to show you some websites where you can learn a whole lot of information about heat pumps because very few of us know that detail, but it's all available. Um, and we're much more effective, as Pam said, we're much more effective in groups. So just for a quick agenda, we want to talk about what's community solar all about, uh, learning more about electrification, more about composting, which this audience doesn't really need, 
and the plastic bag collection and other local opportunities. So community solar, as those of you who are enrolled learned this, uh, community solar is designed for folks who can't put solar on their roofs. When I retired, I really wanted to put solar on our roof and I got quotes very quickly and I was all ready and they said, but Art, you have a clay tile roof and we, we're not sure how to attach solar panels to clay tile roofs. And it's like, okay, so uh, through a long series of discussions with roofing contractors and so forth, it didn't work. People who live in apartments, people who live in condos, people who have trees over their house, community solar is designed for them. And you can see in the first part of this slide, those are many of the people who are candidates for community solar. There are many organizations that are also qualified for community solar, small businesses. This church is a community solar subscriber, uh, as well as individuals. And so the idea, as those of you who are subscribing know, is that somewhere in northern Illinois, there's a solar farm. It might be on the roof of a warehouse like ours is, or it might be in a farm field like many of you have. Uh, there's a, a solar farm that's about the size of a football field and you have a few panels allocated to your subscription that way. And then the confusion comes, there's a, a double billing uh, that because you get a bill not only from ComEd, but you do get a bill from, um, from the, the, uh, the, the solar provider. The benefits for the households are you always get a 15 uh, roughly a 15%, some are as low as five, but I'll show a chart a little later that shows the exact di discounts. And those of you who are already community solar people, you may have found some resources. I'm gonna have some slides and a couple, of bit, a couple about additional resources so you can tell your friends and family about community solar and how great it is. The benefits for the environment are significant. And for Illinois, one of the big benefits is jobs. There's construction jobs, there's over 2,200 jobs that have been created. There are 100 solar farms. Governor Pritzker was at the dedication of the 100th solar farm last November. So there are over 100 and there's one, uh, a couple of new ones every month. Uh, and so there's nine companies active. I'll show you the names of those companies in a little bit. Um, the benefits to the grid, if you think about the electric grid, the grid was built with power, power generators at the center of it. So you had a coal-fired power plant and all the generating capacity was in localized spot. And what, we're, what they're developing is a much more diffuse grid spread over all these sources sprinkled all around the country. And that's gonna be a much more powerful and reliable grid. Um, for all of us going forward. And uh, so, as, so it gives us the ability, it gives the power companies the ability to phase out gas and, and uh, coal-fired power plants. From a customer perspective, the big thing to remember is community solar is just as reliable as existing electric supply. The downside is you will have to spend some thought process to pick a third par far party provider and there is some cycle time from the time you apply for community solar until the time uh, you start getting billed by both ComEd and, uh, and the company. So they, they talk in terms of billing cycles. So typically it's two to six billing cycles. And there's a little more paperwork. Uh, up front, there's a contract to be signed and they're required to give you a legal statement. Remember, most of these companies are newer, especially newer in Illinois. So the idea is they want you to be as confident as a consumer as you are in ComEd. And so to build confidence, that's why they do a lot of this uh, structure up front. And typically you'll get uh, two bills per month. So this is a little complicated. Once you get used to it, it's like, sure, I understand. It's, uh, it's like a, that's, that's how we do business. Uh, but you do remember, need to remember that in terms of ComEd, dealing with ComEd right now, you just pick up a phone and, and things just kind of happen. So I want to spend a little time going to some, uh, some websites and just to walk you through some websites that I use. Look at them, you won't need to. Yeah, oh, they are, they are on here. Yeah, this 
Well, you you must get another way of saying it. So this is the Simpsons Utility Board Day. So this is the Citizens Utility Board website. And this is um, really a lot of people refer to this website for all the information about community solar. And I'm going to click on, there's a lot of educational things about how it just worked, which I summarized. And this little blue tab here, I'm not very good at this without a mouse. These are current community solar offers. And these... These nine companies are all active in both northern and southern Illinois. And so you can sign up with any of these companies, and Citizens Utility Board has developed a handy chart, which I refer to quite often. And this chart really compares the offers for available from all these companies. I haven't figured out yet why Citizens Utility Board doesn't list these in alphabetical order, but they don't. So we've got Nextamp here, and uh, Nextamp is the biggest company. Their headquarters is in Boston, and they've recently said, okay, our, Illinois, our business in Illinois and then the Midwest is big enough that we're going to have a second corporate headquarters in Chicago. So this church subscribes to Nextamp. Many of you may subscribe to Nextamp, uh, and they have the largest uh, market share of all the community solar providers in Illinois. So I just want to walk across this chart and, th and, um, and talk through a little bit about, and you've, you've got this information available on this chart for all nine companies. So utility territory, what that means is uh, in, in Illinois, in the northern area, ComEd is responsible, Amarin is responsible for central and southern Illinois. So in the beginning of community solar, some of these companies only worked in one area or the other. The next column is where some of these companies are differentiated. It's a savings against, and typically it's a savings against the supply side of your bill. If you think about your ComEd bill, it's divided into three parts. There's a supply part and a delivery part and taxes and fees. And most of these companies, their discount only affects the su supply side. Um, then contract term, you see contract terms of 15 to 20 years. This is a great chart to kind of compare these companies. Citizens Utility Board recommends that you get, not quotes, but that you, you really study in some detail at least three of these companies before you select one of them. Uh, whether they have a cancellation fee or not, they all want long-term contracts because that gives them as investors confidence that they're going to have customers over the, the length of the, the service life of the, of the solar farm. Some of the, none of them have a, a, a cancellation fee anymore. Uh, credit checks, some of them run, want, run what they call uh, an informal uh, credit check. It doesn't affect your credit rating. And then the billing. There's four ways to get additional information about any one of these companies. So one way is over here under contact. It lists both a phone number and an email address for the company. And then over here, there are two links in this column. So the first link will take you to Nextamp's website. The second link, Citizens Utility Board has looked at each of these companies, and they have a very detailed two-page analysis of the particular offering by that company. So Nextamp is the biggest in the market area, and so our, we recommend uh, Nextamp. Another company that's been active is uh, Clearway. Clearway is up here, in, and they're a Texas company that's, again, been active in the Illinois market since the beginning. And another company that you should know about is a company called Solstice. And Solstice is a fairly new entry into the marketplace, but they emphasize a program called Solar for All. And so in the legislation that set up community solar in Illinois, there's a set-aside for low and moderate incomes. And, so, and what that means is that some of those funds cannot be spent for typical middle class uh, families. They've got to be spent for in environmental justice areas and other areas impacted by this. So that's all set aside, and the program is called Solar for All. In there, you can get up to a 60% discount on your electric bill, as well as discounts on having solar panels on your roof, as well as discounts on a lot of things, but Solar for All is a very good program if you're income qualified. And Solstice, 
kind of specializes in that. They do have other, uh, if you're just a conventional so community solar, they will, they, they will service you, but they really want to focus on uh, solar for all on that program. So that's one website to talk about. Uh, Pam spent a lot of time talking about electrification, and she spent a lot of time talking about OPCAN, so I want to show you OPCAN's website. So this is OPCAN's website, and it is, I'm not very good at scrolling without a mouse. <laughs> there we go. So this is OPCAN's website. W Pam showed us this, and I'm just going to dig in, drill into this a little more, and thank you to Susan and all your buddies for, for this organization. This website is terrific. It is one, I use it as one-stop shopping uh, for a lot of this information. So here is, in terms of learning, it says, how do I electrify? And then you click on this thing that says resources. And it goes on for page after page, and I'm not going to drill down any further than this. But I want to tell you, you can just, if you have a question about heat pumps, all the stuff that Pam talked about, you can just scroll through here. talks about transportation. And this is a very nice video. Um, Derek Eater is a guy who's very active in OPCAN, and this is about a 10-minute video. He has done what Pam is doing, okay? So he has electrified his home, uh, he, and he just walks you through how he did it. And it's a very casual presentation. I'd encourage each of you to just take 10 minutes and, and watch it. Uh, he spent, and, and again, Pam emphasized it beautifully. You, it's not like you have to replace all your appliances immediately. You want to look at the service life of that product and say, okay, my water heater, it's a new water heater. It's only three years old. It I probably have another 10, 12 years about it. But I do want to be sure that my home is wired correctly so that when that, so I'll be ready, ready for that installation. And Derek walks you through a lot of that. Further on down here, there's a lot of references as I scroll through here, what is a heat pump? Learn about heat pumps, weatherization, insulation. So there's a lot of information on rooftop solar. Uh, they referred right here to the Citizens Utility Board website that we just looked at for community solar. EV, so there's a lot of information on this and I encourage you, it's, it's kind of a one-stop shopping uh, for this. And another website that's very handy is the Village of Oak Park website. So this is compost. We were talking about compost, and the village program, I am not good at, with a mouse at all, am I? <laughs> so the village, and, and I just want to look at a couple of these things for those of you who aren't yet enrolled in, in the village's program. It's really a very nice program. Pam highlighted the opportunity. It's opt-in. All of us who are enrolled kind of signed up, and we pay, pay that on a utility bill. And an opt-in, an opt-out program would mean we're all automatically enrolled. And then it's up to us to contact the village and say, no, 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 I don't want that option. But the usage rate would really double or maybe even triple. Uh, right now, I think 17 is the last number I heard. 17% of Oak Park homes are in the composting program. But it's, uh, it's very different. Uh, there are some folks in, in the congregation, I've been talking to people about composting, and a number of folks around the congregation have very traditional backyard composting, and they weren't even aware of municipal composting. So it's, it's the kind of thing that really we need to just spread the word. Uh, one of the things, come on, Art, <laughs> now I'm back in Google. Would you? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Um, go to the village's site, the, the one that we were just it at. Here it, it, it was there. Oh, there, there. No, wait, that's, that's OPCAN. And, and compost. There it is. And just, thank you, and just go down and open the one that says what, what, what's collected. Oh, this thing doesn't want to scroll. That's the problem. Huh? Oh, it's one of those Apple things. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Well, then I'm back. And, uh, I, I apologize for my clumsiness. Okay, so acceptable materials. This is a nice list of exactly what you can put in, and you can put in 
chicken bones and steak bones and pizza boxes and all that kind of stuff, and then items not accepted. So this is a really cool program, as those of you who are using this program know. It's a great program. <laughs> yeah, it's, she's the idea, Dave's idea of sharing it with a neighbor is, is a good idea. We shared it with a neighbor when we were living in a home as well. This is one of the coolest videos, and it's only a minute and 30 seconds, so I thought I'd take the time to play it. If I figure out how to do it. Take another minute and 30 <coughs> seconds to do that. There you go. Ship's log, start date, Tuesday. Per Starfleet instructions, we are beaming aboard devices crucial to bringing about a recycling revolution. Acting Captain Chuckle here, inviting you to join us on this new enterprise, Outpark's Compostable Program. This program diverts food scraps from landfills, helping reduce greenhouse gas and methane emissions. But maybe best of all, these food scraps become compost, which helps keep soil healthy, ensuring Earth remains a class M planet. Here is how it works. After a space meal or Earth meal, Instead of putting food scraps in the garbage bag, put them in a food scraps receptacle. When it's full, empty it into the 36 decaliter outdoor compost cart. You can put yard waste in it too. That means no more having to buy yard waste bags and stickers. In fact, the cost of the compostable program is nearly offset by that savings. Share the cart and cost with the neighbor and you are in the black. So don't cling on to the old ways of recycling. Make a compostable program your prime directive. <laughs> okay, back to PowerPoint. Because I'm, no, I'm not very good here negotiating this. So we'll get back to PowerPoint. plastic shopping bags. You can drop all your plastic shopping bags off at either Pilgrim Congregational Church down on Lake Street or Temple Har Zion on Harlem Avenue in River Forest. Both have bins near the door and instead of taking them to Jewel, you can take them to those congregations and what there's a program, a company called Trex uh, that will ma make them into park benches. It used to be the could use 500 pounds of plastic bags to convert to a park bench. And so congregations in Oak Park have already, over the past three years, gotten seven of these benches built. And they're scattered around from the Trailside Museum in River Forest to Harm B Community Garden in Austin. Uh, there's one in the, the, the closest one is in the lobby of the public library next door. Uh, but they changed their criteria, and now it takes 1,000 pounds to do it. Uh, but the congregations are very enthusiastic about continuing to collect it. If you drop off your bags at Jewel, they'll end up at the same place, but the congregations won't get credit for it. So it's an, uh, you, you really need to drop them off at the congregations. And they've developed the skills of m m weighing all these plastic bags because it takes about uh, 100 bags to weigh a pound. So there's a, lo there's a lot of work that goes into these collections. Other things going on in April, and these are all on the, on the handouts, and one of the handouts is this sheet, which really uh, about 90% of this sheet came out of the Wednesday Journal. They published a directory a year or so ago of all the organizations in Oak Park 
that are doing community related environmental things and I just took it and put it on a sheet with a few more things about resources so <clears throat> all these are on, and this this handout is over on the table and it lists the uh, many of these organizations there's an organization you, you will find it on this one called West Cook Wild Ones which has a native plant sale and you can order through May 19th the One Earth Film Festival Jim is available um, and, and he's on the board over there and there are some local, two churches are sponsoring two films. On Thursday evening, April 18th, there's a double feature at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. Um, and they also have an action fair there. So if you go at 515, you can talk to community organizations like OPCAN and get more information there. Uh, and the films themselves start at 6 o'clock. So that's on Thursday evening, April 18th. The theme of those movies is water. The next day, Friday the 19th, right across the street from here at Unity Temple at 6 o'clock, they'll have a double feature about disposability. So, and, and the, uh, the One Earth Film Festival, as it says on the screen there, they have showings uh, th throughout the week uh, of, of, uh, of Earth Week. Paper shredding at the Village Public Works on South Boulevard. They're going to be doing both paper shredding and styrofoam collection. Uh, there's a, a cleanup in Columbus Park on the same day. Um, next week, a week from today, at Fair Oaks Presbyterian Church, a little bit north of here, they will have a program on Environmental Justice 101. That's an adult ed education program just like this. And when I talked to Linda Martins this week, she, she said, be sure to invite anybody you talk to who wants to go. Uh, it's at 9 o'clock at Fair Oaks. And, uh, I do want to mention another organization called Go Plastic Free. They work very hard on very practical ways of reducing plastic in our lives. So those themes that we talked about, continuing education is critical. And I hope by showing the OPCAN website and those other websites, you've got some sources for, con for continuing education that we're all going to need. We are much more effective in community. And so we've talked about joining organizations. The environmental justice team here at First United can always use uh, more enthusiasm. There's all kinds of organizations around town, and many of them are listed on this handout. And remember, it's a sustainability journey. So the Village of Oak Park is doing a nice job. And this is a handout. And there are three slightly different handouts. The Village of Oak Park came out with this. These are the top five actions for homeowners. And there's another one over there on the table that's the top five actions for apartment residents. And there's another one that's the top five actions for condo owners. So they really thought about this and said, what, are you can, what can I do as an individual? So the number one and number two on each of these cards has something to do with either solar or electrification. So those are the two big themes that are consistent. Whether you're a homeowner or whatever, wherever you live, I hope you take away from this presentation. I got to work on solar and I got to need to think about electrification. And then the other three here for the homeowners, convert your lawn, lawn to native plants, uh, travel clean. How can you with all the ways of travel and, and compost. So those are all things that we know about, but the village has nicely summarized them. Thank you. <laughs> Questions for me or for Pam or for Jim? Styrofoam, you took it away one day a month and it got rid of all our styrofoam? There are, there are two styrofoam. Uh, question is, what do we do about styrofoam? There has been a program in Western Springs for four or five years now, I think, where on the first Saturday of every month, the Western Springs Congregational Church manages the program. They work with a company called Dart Industries, and from 9 to 12, every first Saturday of every month, you can drive to the parking lot of um, the, th it's the, the Western Springs Theater uh, right in that area down near the railroad tracks in Western Springs. And so you can save up. Uh, Hil uh, Hilda Fisher, is, who's a member of this congregation, collects her styrofoam, and I go over to her house and pick it up and take it over there with, with, uh, for
from our condo. Our condo has a collection site in the basement. The Village has started it. This is the second styrofoam that I'm aware of in the public works. And so you can just take it over to the public works on uh, April 20th. Does that answer your question? Yeah. It goes back to Dart in Industries. And Dart Industries, their product is styrofoam, and so they make it into anything that can be extruded, basically. So uh, they do a lot of uh, corner moldings. They do extruded uh, things like pens. So they make, they make product out of it. They don't use soft pro uh, styrofoam, like uh, wrapping bubbles and uh, peanuts for packing. They can't use that. They can only use solid styrofoam. But they're, it, it's... The number one thing is avoid styrofoam wherever possible. Right. So you don't want to get styrofoam, but it is, it's in our society. And so if you end up with styrofoam, then put, put it someplace where it can be reused. And let me just add that there's, a, there's a, a bill before the legislature to try to ban styrofoam in our state. And uh, so keep your eye on uh, the General Assembly because when the bill, uh, and I, I don't know how far the bill has gotten because I haven't followed that one, but I know that there's a major effort to ban styrofoam right now, here. Hmm? Yeah, it's banned here. But the, right, the restaurants are ignoring it and it's not banned in the state yet. I'm happy to come and present. The, it's a, the, the question is, yeah. your initial community solar subscription may end up only covering a fraction of your use, maybe 80% or 50% or 95%, or uh, Paul just had to leave the room, but I know Paul's coverage is 103%, so some, sometimes they allocate just about the right amount. If they allocate it a little less, or if you have a lot more need uh, for elect, they will make adjustments. Capacity has been an issue in the community solar, so you, you might have to call them several times and say, hey, I need capacity, and they might say, yeah. it might take as long to get the extra capacity as it did to get initially enrolled, but they, they are aware of that issue. Did you have, you wanna? Yeah, I, I, I was just gonna say the same thing. <laughs> I, I, now that I'm having a heat pump put in, I'm gonna call them early and, and let them know. Then they will. Mm -hmm. I'm not aware. Are you Dave's aware question is there a community wind program, and yeah. neither of us is aware of that. Okay. I can just say briefly uh, the wind system is going to be utility solar. Uh, solar, community solar tends to be one or two uh, football fields in size per room, and then two to one five in Florida, I think it's one per thousand. Man, so A, a, win, a windmill?
they do it with calculation. They don't, they, the, let's say there's 2,000 panels in a farm and Sharon and I are allocated five of those panels. And all they do is they take, and five is a fraction of 2,000, and they take that percentage and use that. So they, they don't do, in the, the electrons that come off those panels are not the same electrons that are gonna get, get delivered to your house. It, it, because they just pump electrons onto the grid and you remove electrons to the grid. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the, the, that has been one of the, one of the problems is how do they get interconnected to the grid, but that they seem to have solved that problem recently. Uh, I'll let no, you. We, we've actually been having some the people. The question is: the question is, uh, do you have to be a resident of Oak Park to work with OPCAN? Uh, we, uh, we've had some people sitting in recently that are not from Oak Park, and so uh, where are you from? Oh yeah, well, why don't you just join in? Yeah, I don't know about community solar. In, I know Michigan just has some legislation that they're just getting started in community solar. I'm not aware of Ohio. They've had a lot of scandals in their um, utility providers, as you may know. So I don't think Ohio does, but you could check into it. An opt out? Well, I guess you'd have to ask our trustee. Uh, the, uh, the <laughs> um, we, you know, well, I, I think that I think that we need to advocate for it. It's not. Yeah. There's a real appreciation, I think, at the board level of. Um, there's a real appreciation at the board level of adding more required fees to people in the village. So there's always the balance. Uh, this board is particularly concerned about low-income residents. It's $15 a month, right? We share with our neighbors. So um, that's, not that's not insignificant at all. In fact, there would, we would probably be highly criticized to require $15 a month increase. That's a huge increase for low-income houses. Um, so I do think we need to work because a lot, and a lot of people are sharing, the spins are huge. Nobody's filling them up. So no, no single household. So I think that stuff needs to be worked out, but it's on, it's on the Environmental and Energy Commission's um, action, um, action plan. I'm pretty sure they're gonna be addressing it this year. But the, so those kinks do need to be addressed. You know, I haven't heard that. I think it's more the cost. I mean, if it were free, then it, we'd be doing it. So we, we need to figure that out and prioritize it on the village level. I think some other things have, have been higher in priorities, like rebates for energy efficiency to low-income houses, which is another program, low-income homeowners and runners. So Debbie's comment is that even in the existing compost program, one of the problems is that the, they call it, I think, contamination. Uh, people put the wrong type of items in a compost bin as opposed to a recycling bin, and that continues to be a problem, and Debbie just wanted to point that out. Go ahead.
You're right. The school population is a great opportunity to, to, to get the education going. One of the things, that, and I'll just close with this, one of the things about composting that I just discovered, it's been a continuing concern in Oak Park that units, uh, residences, buildings over five units, have a r they don't participate in any of the village's municipal p garbage collection. And uh, as a result of uh, Carol's husband, actually, Dave Goulias, uh, found a service that does collection of compost at these buildings. And so th for those of you who are condo residents, see me or see Jim, and we, we have the name now of a company that will do, pick, do compost pickup at your buildings. So waste not. waste not. Thank you. And if you, if you just do wastenot.com, they're down in Chicago. Thank you. Thank you, this has been great. We're so glad you've been here. Remember that, um, before we clap for the group again, remember that next Sunday, we go back to the 9.45 start time, not the 9.30 start time. But um, once again, thanks to Pam, to Art, to, to Art, to Jim, and, and to, uh, uh, thanks to you, Pete, for filming these, for, to have put them on YouTube. It's been a great series.